playing uh, Benedict, not Beatrice, right? Yep. Benedict. Yeah. <laughs> that was uh, another theater. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, David Ivers is, as many of you know, is the one of two artistic directors here at the festival. He has been performing here as an actor in for over 20 years. Um, has been in Much Ado About Nothing five times, three of those here at the festival. As I mentioned, he was Benedict. He has also played Dogbury. He has played, no, yes? Uh, yeah, that I didn't do here. Right, but, but you yeah. have played Dogbury, yes. And uh, um, so we'll get into that a little bit as we go further, but I want to mention to those of you who've been coming, and I hope you were here last year, because this gentleman here was uh, absolutely, in my opinion, and in the opinion of many people who came to these seminars, absolutely extraordinary as Salieri in our production last year. Oh, yeah. 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 Yes, it was yeah. it was quite something. So he's not reprising uh, that role this year, but he will be <laughs> in the odd couple in, uh, in the, the show that's coming uh, in a few in in a few months, actually. Uh, he and Brian Vaughn are playing Oscar and Felix. They will be rotating in those roles. And as I heard last night, um, on Saturdays of those performances, the audience will decide which one of them will be Felix that night and which one will be Oscar. <laughs> so you won't want to miss that. A little bit different from uh, Amadeus, yeah. right? As if we don't have enough to do. <laughs> Anyway, welcome David Ivers. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Oh, and I, I did I neglect to mention something very important. Bailey Smith, <laughs> yes. the play manager here at the festival. <laughs> None of this would happen without uh, here at where we're calling the canvas O as opposed to the wooden O across the way. Uh, Bailey gets everything organized, keeps me on track, and she is a junior at Southern Utah University comes to us from Pullman, Washington, a major in theater and political science. So thank you, Bailey Smith. Okay, so uh, David Ivers, Much Ado About Nothing. Um, I wanted to ask you, well, a couple of things, then we'll turn the, the microphone over to the public. Um, you've been in, you know the play very well. You've been in it numerous times. When you knew you were going to direct it, how did you decide which version that you would choose to, to do, uh, taking a little bit, I know, from the first folio, a, a bit from, uh, I think you used the Pelican version. How do you determine that, and how much of your time is spent figuring out the script? Um, I, that's a good question. Um, you know, they're, they're, I, I, they're not really versions, you know, that I guess is, uh, that's a misleading term in some ways. Not, it's not a combination of you mentioning it, but it always rings, a little bizarre to me because they're basically editorial, you know, um, perceptions of the folio, you know, based on different publishers. And really the quintessential, for me, the quintessential publisher is the Arden uh, version, as a word, of these Shakespeare scripts. But they're really hard to act from. I know that sounds weird because they're like this thick. And so like a 90 page script is 300 pages because there there is about this much text per page in the Arden, and then double that in terms of notations about meaning, historical context of a word, a line, a, a monetary uh, reference, you know. And so uh, I go to the Pelican because actually it is an extraordinarily thin script, has most of the text a little bit wider, and it's really easy when you're acting, especially in a comedy, to hang on to it. I know that sounds silly, but it's a tactile thing, and you know what it's like to hold something while you're, you know. And so I start with the Pelican in reference to the Arden, and then uh, with my dramaturg, a young woman who I absolutely adore, who worked with me for the first time on Charlie's Aunt last year, named Isabel Smith Bernstein, young in her career, old soul in her world. And um, I'm really, really excited about what she's going to do in the future. She's going off to get her PhD and her master's in Boulder this next year. Anyway, so we started working on uh, our our kind of text, and it is just that. It's a product of, you know, I think in the folio this word's used, or there's interesting that in the folio there's a 
a colon here, and it's a comma in a publisher's edition. And there's a difference, right? You know, when you say this with a comma, or you say this, here comes the list, you know, um, those things make a difference in terms of how the plane moves. And so, you know, the process of time, we'd send that stuff electronically, what an age we're in, you know, to be able to do that with notes, and then put our script together, kind of did our own version of it, sent it out electronically to the company, put our cuts in it, able to strike through the cuts electronically so that you can still read them, you know, uh, but know that the actors know that those lines are cut. We used to not really be able to do that unless we're doing it by pencil. Really important thing so that you know what's being said, even though we've cut it and you can still read it in context. And that's uh, that's how we started. Okay, so when you, um, the other morning when you were our guest, you mentioned, uh, even though you've been in it numerous times, you were trying to figure out what to do with this play. And you talked about a swing and a tree. Do you want to tell the audience about that? Yes, I don't think I need to now. Yeah, I, um, you know, I've been in it. It's just struck me that I've, when you said we've done it eight times, I, I hadn't looked that up, but I realized that it's true as I hurl towards middle, I'm at middle age, um, <laughs> that I've been a part of half of those productions in the history of this theater. Um, uh, and so because of that and because of my experience with the play outside of here, uh, I've never directed it. And I said to Nancy, it was a bit nostalgic that I, the last time, oddly, that I appeared on the Adam stage was when I played Benedict. I haven't, been, I haven't acted out there, I've directed out there, which sort of made me sad. And I thought, what a neat thing for the first time I've directed this play to have it be the first thing outside in the new theater. So that was part of it. And then I, I was thinking about the play and I, I literally um, woke up and I had an image of Benedict, more mature, pushing a more mature Beatrice in a swing. That, that's that's literally it was great. Yeah, and I thought, oh, I wonder, I wonder why I'm thinking that. Maybe I'm not feeling very free at the moment. Um, maybe I'd like something breezy and carefree in my life. But I I did, and I and I took it to heart as often we do when we have dreams or things. Uh, that are percolating in this work that we do. And I started looking at the text from the position of Beatrice and Benedict being more mature, which is not a new idea. It's been done before. It's not, I don't lay claim to it. Um, and I started building from the end of the play when I realized, oh, that's got to be the final image of the play, back. And then all of a sudden what started happening is I researched where Shakespeare sets the play and started reading about citrus fruits and olives and olive oil. And when you look at the colors, I have researched pictures of, of homes and residences. When you match all the colors together, it looks like the top of a freshly baked pizza. The, the <laughs> creams and the yellows and the you know the Mediterranean influence. And I thought, well, I wonder, I wonder if I could locate this production responsibly in period. Um, in a really breezy, fresh way at Leonardo's estate, which we've just assumed is an orchard of sorts, you know, winemaking, uh, all the things you see. I call it my, my personal farm to table restaurant. Uh, and, and what if there were things that were reminiscent of childhood? What if there were things that without hitting it over the head were sort of jungle gym like ladder, tree, swing, you know, these trees, orchard, you know, um, looking at things where I'd read it and I'd say, oh, I wonder, if, you know, she's lying. We got to, this is starting, you know, like these things started all of a sudden make sense to me responsibly about where the place set, how it's set, and how I could try to, in a very tight container in a way, keep over justifying the location and that it being, so instead of it being arbitrary, here come the two best looking guys I have ever seen in my life behind you. Those are my sons. Sorry. Hi, <laughs> hey guys. <laughs> Sorry. There's my Beatrice right there. <laughs> Love you guys. Um, 
Uh, so anyway, uh, that that's really, you know, and I, it just got more specific. You know, it started in this wide frame, and it just, I was able to say, no, David, stay true to the orchard, stay true to what is here. And, and also just then the cast and the designers inform that idea when I present it. And we get a lot of, oh, what if, what ifs? And you can't do better than with a group of theater people who are engaged by saying, what if? Okay, so one final uh, comment, maybe, from me, a uh, question. Uh, the casting, how did you decide to cast your Burgess? <laughs> <laughs> um, Fred Adams, what a gem. You know, I, I went to Brian and I said, dude, <laughs> we got to get Fred involved, you know, this is his, we wouldn't be, none of us would be here, you know that, we all know that without mm -hmm. this, and, and a lot of us put our blood, sweat, and tears into making this happen, a lot of you put your hard-earned resources and blood and sweat and tears into making this happen, and uh, we knew Fred wasn't going to direct, you know, in the season, he was mad at us, but we have to make hard decisions sometimes. <laughs> and I said to Brian, you know what? I want him to be on that stage, yeah. and I want to cast him as Burgess. And I don't know that he'd say yes, but are you cool if I make the ask? And he's like, yeah, totally. And so, you know, I asked, and he was like, well, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> With an immediate, I'll take it, right? <laughs> and, you know, he... The thing about Fred is no matter what it is, in truth, no matter what he's doing, what he's going through, the answer is always like, I'll do anything I can to help. I'll do anything I can to help. Are you sure? I'm sure. Okay. And he's awesome, you know? He's so hilarious. Yeah, so, you know, we just felt like he needed to, to stand on that stage and, you know, be on it and be represented. Was it your idea or the... Of the, the, the dog berry. yeah, to point out that hey, this is Fred. Here's what I said to him I said, dollars to donuts, they'll applaud. Oh, yeah. So if that happens, make the gesture. If it doesn't, move on with the scene. Okay. Good work. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so I'll send the microphone out, and we've got a little bit of a distance for it to travel. So if you can help me out and Bailey when you're through with your question or comment, uh, hold up your hand and we'll pass it to you. So here we go, over here in other the one, sun. Other oh, other one, okay. Good morning. Well, your Beatrice and Benedict did very well on your playground. I was very impressed the way that they were able to yeah. climb around. <laughs> that was great. But my question to you, we had a seat where we could kind of see you last night and the stage. So sometimes we were all peeking over watching your reaction to your <laughs> production. <laughs> As a director, do you feel like you were able to realize the artistic vision that you had? Or were there little things maybe that didn't quite make it the way you wanted? How did you feel last night watching it? I'll let you answer that question. <laughs> what do you think? I think it was fantastic. Well, no, no, I mean, I'm just saying, do you think I'm ever satisfied? Well, I know. <laughs> I'm my director community theater stuff, but um, so I know how I feel. Yeah. It's hard to sit there, and, and, but it's, it's so wonderful to watch your actors fulfill your vision and to see the audience reacting. So did you enjoy it? Uh, yeah, enjoy to, it? to an extent. I mean, I'll put it to you this way. Uh, I love the acting company. I'm extraordinarily proud of them. We Last night was the best, the best pass through of the show that we've had. It was a huge leap from the last preview, in part because it wasn't 105 degrees outside, which was <laughs> brutal, um, but also because we had a really great note session in the afternoon. I was heard, they were heard, I was pretty tight about, there's no more debate. These are the things that I need to see realized in the production now, and if you can't deliver it now, then we have to have a different conversation. Not not in a you're fired sort of way, but but just a, just a we have, we, we have to, I have to see this. I, if I don't see it, I don't know that it's, that it's incorrect or correct, you know? So, Give, give it a shot, you know, and, and let's see. And many of those things were realized last night, so I was thrilled. Are there things to work on? You bet. Are you paying top dollar? No. <laughs> so it's a preview. It's a working rehearsal, and what I learned from you last night, I will take right into rehearsal. Um, but for me, extraordinarily proud of it. That could have stood for me 
last night absolutely as a production inside of a you know public performance for a paying audience i would have been fine if if you know people were writing critiques about it not really because we're not open but i mean in terms of the way the way in which the notes and the way in which the production move forward i i very rarely will sit in the production i direct and you know cheer because i'm in math i'm right here i'm not here because um, I'm, I'm looking at stuff and I'm, I'm listening to you as well, you know, and I'm um, leaning over to my assistant and saying, tell her to move left. I gotta, I gotta fix that. I gotta see this. We should be getting a laugh there or not. You know, wow, I can't believe we got a laugh there. This audience is. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so, you know, you, you know that, that's, that's kind of the process. I'm sure it's similar to what you go through when you're directing, you know. Hello. Hello. Hi, we're Bert and Sandy. We've been coming about 20 years, and they are really enjoying some of just unbelievable productions. And last night was surprising. I mean, it was really, really good year to be commended. Oh, and nice. I think, I think most, most of all, for, for bringing Fred into it, that was just amazing. <laughs> I, I talked to him last year, and quite frankly, I'm really disappointed in what they've done here. This, that doesn't fit in. His vision was to have villages and all that. You probably know that. Oh, yeah, so, I know. <laughs> so, anyway, who knows? I'm old, too. So, <laughs> but thank you for what you did. Thank, thank you very, very much. Appreciate it. It's always, it's definitely hard to change. You know? okay, there. What did you think of the ad, ad lib? What? What did, you, what did you think of the ad lib? Fine. Wasn't that great? I thought it was <laughs> awesome. You can plan someone to do that every, every month. Oh, no. <laughs> But, but yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm totally good with it, especially if the audience initiates it. It's like, you know, I always say if you sit in the front row, at, you know, with that Sea World, you're going to get wet. You know? <laughs> hey, uh, my question is for the kind of, uh, there's a lot of acrobatics yeah. uh, involved with the tree, with the, the ladder. How much of that was your decision, or did you get a lot of. Um, Bucking from the actor saying, uh, you want me to what? <laughs> uh, no, great question. No, no, no pushback from the actors. Um, the actors that I knew were going to be working on it, I had contacted well before they got here saying, hey, I'm thinking about this is the playground I'm thinking about. It. And they were thrilled, you know, because you got to, we got to, you got to be creative with that going scene, you know, it's like you got to, You've seen it in various ways, and again, I said I wanted to try to figure out how to locate it as part of the world, you know. Um, and they were thrilled. I, I will say that those scenes, particularly the ladies' gone scene, they're both still developing. And the reason for that is, is I have been in a rehearsal hall without a tree and without a ladder until two weeks ago. So all of it has been in theory. In theory, you climb up here and we figure out how to, that's, upside down. that is petrifying. I have been there. I was there last time we did this and we had that wine press and I didn't get it until three days before we had an audience. I was grumpy, let me tell you. Because it's, it's a lot to lay out, especially in a comedy. If it ain't funny, you know it. You know? It's true. It's like, well, that didn't work. <laughs> you know? And so um, they are amazing. And we have had to drill that stuff. And as a matter of fact, it's on the top of the list for our next rehearsal just to review again and look at those scenes and see how they're climbing. Do we need to create, carve out some more handholds? You know, do we need to pad the ladder anywhere else? Does Kim want to come on the other side of it? Does Ben want to? So, I mean, they, they were thrilled. I think for me, it works really well as a device, you know, and um, we're going to work, we're, we're keeping at it. But, but they were totally game. Yeah, totally game. I'd like to ask about Don John. Um, I don't know whether he was couldn't decide whether he was evil or or, or crazy. Um, and I just I just like your take on him. Yeah, I, I sort of love what Jay Todd's doing because it, it doesn't it doesn't pretend to be anything else really that but but, but what it is, you know, is he occupies a very sort of clear path that I I just want to prevent. I want to stir the pot, you know harm people and it feeds me you know it sort of it sort of perpetuates the next thing and i love how strong he's coming at it and it, it has a the tiniest bit of melodrama in it 
which Shakespeare, I think, asks for, you know? Um, and the interesting thing is, is, and I talked about this in the last thing, in the last uh, seminar, but if you really look at the play the next time you see it here or other, anywhere else or you read it, it's amazing to me that every single subplot, every single plot in the play is set in motion by what people hear or what people see. Not by what they're told directly. I mean, that, that, that's, that's, that's contradicting myself. It is what they're told directly, but it's about other events. You know, it's hearsay. And they take it like it's gold and put it in their pocket. And I was saying that it's interesting to me that the audiences, modern audiences, so readily accept that notion when it comes to the gulling scenes. And they just, they hate it when Claudio hears something and he, he acts on it. You sort of, it's sort of contradictory. It's a modern audience's guilt, really. I'm like, well, we're not that way. But <laughs> that we're projecting, projecting onto the, the people in this play. But, but I say you can't accept that you love Beatrice and Benedict hearing that they love each other and acting on it and not accept that Claudio hears his fiance has cheated on him and he's going to act on it. And I really tried to press that forward with the cast to say your actions are based on something that you are you're really investing in about what others say about a situation. And that's an interesting, interesting thing about the play. And if you've read my director's notes, uh, which are in the souvenir program, I, I talk about the fact that in Shakespeare's time, the, the title of the play would have been pronounced and received as much ado about noting. Noting, not, nothing wasn't pronounced as nothing, even though nothing was a word. I mean, the meaning was there, noting. So if you look at the play as what do people note to take note to to note down, you know, it has a, it informs the play in a very interesting way, and that was part of our exploration. Yeah, where's the mic? Here and here and then we're coming over here. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, I was just pointing her out. She oh. was part of the ad lib. Oh, oh. Sorry. thank you. <laughs> you can come back on Thursday. <laughs> I um, almost always go to the previews, and this is by far the best preview I have ever seen. The energy, Bless your heart. the dance, the just, the cast was, they were together, and they were having fun. Yeah, they, they were. Us fun. Um, the only one that was second place is last year's Charlie's Aunt. It seems to me... You are able to. Well, I need to get a bronze medal next yeah. year. Um, sweet, sweet. I'm the Michael Phelps of Shakespeare. Uh, you are able to uh, work with the cast so that they are really one. I was just amazed and loved it having, having had seen it like four or five times. Oh, thank you. It means a lot to me. It really does. And, you know, it isn't just me. I, I got to sort of lead the ship, but anyone that's a good leader knows that, like, you know, you get credit, you get credit where it necessarily credit isn't due. That that cast, they lead each other, they lead the organization, they, they're an incredible ensemble, they they, they give ideas, they, 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 I come into rehearsal and they can look at me and know he's had four and a half hours of meetings about a bathroom or something, so let's, <laughs> let's make him laugh, you know? Uh, and that's true, you know. And so, so, so I thank you, and I and I appreciate the compliment, and I take it to heart. But I also want to make sure you understand that that, as you know, it it is such a group effort. It's a collaborative art, and, and that cast they they brought it last night. They heard me. They heard each other. They learned from the first preview, and I, I was so thrilled. We have work to do, but we're on the right track. I think, you know. And I also will say the audience last oh, night fantastic. was incredible. Yeah. And as David mentioned on Monday night, it was so hot in the theater, and the audience was still they were really they were really with us. But David mentioned uh, when he was here Tuesday morning that the minute the sun went down and we got a little bit of a breeze, everything just lifted. Yeah. And last <laughs> night the weather helped us, and and you all were, we were so terrific. grateful it wasn't uh, pouring. Oh. Uh, yeah, I, I will tell you, I was so, uh, you may have seen that on my face, I was so nervous because my rehearsal in the theater yesterday was canceled. I mean, it wasn't canceled, we moved inside, but it, it's kind of worthless at this point, you know. 
So we ended up with a, maybe an hour outside of rehearsal because of the downpour. So I, we did notes and we talked, and actually in some ways it was better, but I was, please don't rain, and please remember, you know, what we did three days ago, you know, <laughs> which is so hard, you know. I mean, if you think you're having troubles, think of Wimbledon. Oh, I know, right? I mean, I, yeah. Someone mentioned the acrobatics. The acrobatics actually made me a little nervous. Uh, when it was the only the only indication that I had that Don John had any guts at all was when it looked like he was going to jump off the of Brooklyn Bridge. Uh, yeah. Otherwise, he was just an Iago from start to finish. I mean, not you yeah. didn't get a chance to see him quite as evil. But I was I was actually nervous when those guys were sitting at the top of the tree and thinking how easy it would be for them to fall. And you know, the Don John. I mean. It worked great, yeah. but initially I was sure. kind of nervous. I was too. As a matter of fact, I told Jay Todd, who I, I love them all, but he plays Don John. You know, it was his idea in the hall. He said, do you think I can get out on the railing and like in the first entrance when he's really distraught, you know? And I said, well, we can try it. And we got out there and I was like, dude, I don't know, man. You know? <laughs> I was like, are you sure? And he's like, it's great. You know, he's like, it feels right. And it's, and I said, uh, all right, you know, and some people also express nerves and, and, uh, and I said, if, if you're comfortable, and then we check safety with the rail, you know, through our technical department. And so like, no, it's, it's good. You know, he's just gotta, just gotta make sure he's hanging on. <laughs> but I said, I have a feeling he will make sure he hangs on, but, but I, 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 I understand. Down front here. Thanks. I love your shirt, by the way. Oh, thank you. Uh, his too. Yours is right. He's got a Shakespeare. <laughs> Yours is sort of boring, but his. Is... I maybe I like it for No, I was wondering. I assume that you've seen the Kenneth Branagh Iacocca movie, and I'm wondering how hard it is as a director to kind of get that out of your mind. No, not, much? not hard at all. I, People that know me will, will tell you that I, I am a person that absolutely does no research by visual means of other productions while, while I'm in the midst of uh, directing. None. I didn't do it with Amadeus. I don't do it when I'm acting. I, don't, I refuse to watch The Odd Couple because I I'm, I'm impressionable and also like, I, I feel like I, I'm smart enough. Now, it works for some people, and I applaud that. It doesn't work for me. You know, some people I know I have friends that research and research and go see other productions that they're gonna before they direct, you know. And for me, it just doesn't work because I gotta come at things from a really healthy place of anarchy that lives in me and cynicism <laughs> and joy. And that that's what David is. I am truthfully like I have to have both of those things working at the same time. And as soon as I see something, it's not coming from that place. It's coming now. I have to like have a buffer in between my healthy and insane need to push buttons and to be cynical and to be all of the joyous, fun things that I think I can be. And that's where I want to come from my work, you know? So. Okay, so I have to, I have to follow up. On that same line, then, since you've been in these productions so many times and played various characters, <clears throat> when you started on this and you had, as a casting director, you and Brian, you cast it and you had a certain image at some point in rehearsal, did you think about, well, when I said that line or when I was in that production? Oh, totally. Of course, that's ingrained in my muscle memory. I know this. I know every line of this play. We didn't need anyone on script. People would call line and I, I would yell it out. I know. I, I do. I mean, it's just because I've, I've done it so many times and I love these plays. And, you know, Ben kept telling me, you know, Kim, everyone's like, it's like, I just know it. You know, I know, I know the text. And yeah, I hear things, and and a lot of things I I say to Ben in my brain, like wow, I I did the exact same thing. You know, his instincts would lead to a place that there's only kind of one road to travel in execution of a comic line uh, where it has its most potency, in my opinion. And uh, I heard it all over the place. And there's stuff that I think they're doing that is totally different than I've heard before. You know, completely more modern, some stuff more lyrical. Uh, I've heard Don John in a whole new way. I've heard Don Pedro, which I played in an entirely new light, and I pushed Larry. That's a little bit of that anarchy meets, you know what I mean? Just saying, no, let's 
let's go against what we know as a fence, which I didn't do at all. You know, I, 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 I played a more melancholy and very kind of, you know, like uh, with some poetry in there. And, and I, Larry's 10 times better than I ever was, you know, and I'm a hero. So, so I definitely hear it, you know, uh, but it's like this. It's two composers, two different composers with the same score. You know, they, they have interpreted differences in their technique and the way, you know, and, and the way they, they, they accentuate a theme over another theme. An oboe is important here where another composer or orchestrator might put a, a viola, you know. And so I don't think I can pull that out of my brain uh, with any of the plays I do, you know. And I don't, I don't want to pull that out of my brain. That, that I'll never forget. But I don't, I don't try to impose it. You know, I don't, I don't try to say, no, you got to do it this way. And I think the, the, the task would, would, would uh, stand behind that idea. And it seemed to me that the uh, Claudio hero story is very front and center in this production. Yes, absolutely. I'm glad. Thank you. It has to be. Beatrice and Benedict are a subplot, actually, the main story. They are on paper and structurally. They, 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 they're the, the main story, the main conflict, right? Yeah, yeah. The dramatic action is is centered on Hero and Claudio. That's the thing that springs the play into another ether. Not Beatrice and Benedict's. Are we going to get together? We it's better written, you know, and we find it more uh, palatable, you know. But yeah. right behind you. That uh, beautiful duet that the singers did, where did that come from? That came from um, one of my dearest friends and my most cherished collaborator in the theater, Greg Kaufman, who's a composer and a music director who I've worked with since college. And I love, he composed the score to Cyrano de Bergerac that I directed here in 2008 that Brian and Melinda worked in the center of. Um, he did all the orchestrations and the reorchestrations for the coconuts which he and I helped develop, and I directed the world premiere of, uh, and is now here, uh, under a different direction, but uh, same score. And uh, we we collaborated on what this score would be. I wanted it to be composed originally. I really wanted to get Greg back to our theater, and uh, I will pass on uh, the compliments, if it is a compliment, because I, I, I think it's astonishing. It's amazing. Uh, I was one of the folks that uh, got treated to a little shower in uh, oh, did uh, row A last night. I took the note, actually. I was, I, I was just curious what, what liquid uh, was in the bottle. <laughs> it's sulfuric acid. I'm still here. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's, I think it's cranberry juice light. I think darkened down a little bit. It's, so that, that sorry was, about that. Well, it's not a problem. Yeah. I, mean, I, was, I was rather amused by it. I'm not, <laughs> sure, I'm not sure the person in my right was yeah. really thrilled. But, I actually uh, took a note last night. I was like, "Funny, great," which we find it. I was like, "Now if you could spray up, you know, so that we get, you know, these people get excited." When you, when you have a spit take, you're just, you know, you're thinking about it about like, you know, 10, 15 seconds. Well, you're like, "Here, it's coming." It's coming. <laughs> Can't wait, you know. I lose all control. Thanks for being a good support. No problem. It's good to see you. Good to see you. Uh, your, your earlier comment about you didn't get wet if you go to yeah, see you know, yeah. certain, certain places. I, I imagine you took what happened last time. So, <laughs> anyway, but uh, I was I found myself wondering whether it was actually planned. I mean, I know, I know you folks wouldn't deliberately say, let's see how many people we can spit on. But, uh, I, I might. But, <laughs> okay. No, it was planned, yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Staying with the uh, spitting theme, um, <laughs> was it cherries we were spitting at each other? What is it? They were it's uh, olives. Were they literally eating olives? Yeah. 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 Which actually is another section I have notes on that we have to work because I keep telling the guys we got to, you know, we got to figure out. They keep eating at different times, and I keep saying, I think you need to eat here, here, and here so that you can be done with the food by the time you speak or when you're ready to spit, or else all that stuff isn't going to work. You sort of get half the idea right now. That's that's going in back into the into the workshop on the Monday. 
the olives are real, but, but the manure is not. Right? <laughs> no, it's real. <laughs> no, it's not real. <laughs> Actually, the manure is mostly um, is mostly rubber, uh, so that, that there are bigger chunks, you know, and we can get it swept swept up a little easier. It, it reminded me. Um, I was I was wondering about the cups that were used. They looked a little out of context. The, the <laughs> I thought cup. they were plastic. Oh, that you? was the only thing that I noticed. I thought. But the setting was so incredibly yeah. perfect. I wish that's a good note, actually. I'll, I'll, it looks plastic. And they let me tell you what they are. Okay. I know it won't fix that, but I but I will take the note because I think it's valuable. They're actually special orders and made for the production. Oh, no, They're, I'm so sorry. No, no. <laughs> it's still a good note. It is. They are modeled ceramic. They're handmade so that they're they look, you know, like and they're just not reading. They're reading all white. Yeah. And now that I yeah. And from a distance, they yeah. I don't know. Did anyone else yeah. Yeah. catch the yeah. other thing? Yeah. Yeah. I thought I was okay. yeah, I yeah, think I, I think I had the benefit of holding them and seeing up close and saying, Wow, these are so beautiful and they're so of the world actually because they're handcrafted, you know. But we'll uh, we'll put that into we'll put that into the mix. I think it's super Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Don't apologize. <laughs> well, trust me, if I don't believe, if I don't care, I'll ignore you until the day. <laughs> but I, but I think, but here, you have to hear me when I say I think it's a good note. If I think it's a bad note, I'll say thank you. I don't do it. <laughs> I'm going to come to your job while you're at your computer and be like, uh, how's it going? I don't, that doesn't, no, no, no. That doesn't. I don't like that. That sentence is horrible. You're going to write that to your boss? <laughs> <laughs> you don't want me in your work, so, so. No, it's a good note. It really is. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Even though they cost a thousand dollars each. Yeah, no, hundred twenty bucks. Okay, you can put them in the books. I mean, in the gift store. All of them. Gift store. Gift store. No, no, no. Actually, what we can do, which I think will make a difference, is get some color. You know, get some porcelain paint on it, so it yeah. gets a deeper model of yeah. creams and oranges and. So come, I'll tell you what, I'm going to do it next week if you buy another ticket to see the play. So, um, <laughs> I'm supposed to bring my You go up, okay, okay, you come find me and say, okay. David, the cups are oh, made the production. <laughs> production RSC now, what good to do? Do what? I don't know that we'll have it done by Thursday. We'll have to put some, we'll have to put Oh, the heckler. <laughs> <laughs> so I got two major problems with yeah. the production. Cups, and we don't have a full-time heckler. <laughs> All right, I'm okay so far. Make a note. Yeah. <laughs> Me again. I love coming to the previews because we get to deal with the directors, some of whom aren't here the whole season, obviously. But I have to ask two literary questions. As at the end, that both of you can help answer. As at the end of Measure for Measure, every time I see this, I find myself saying, why does she still want to marry this jerk? <laughs> Number two, I always ask, is the marriage of Benedict and Beatrice going to last? Or are they going to kill each other within the first week? <laughs> okay, so uh, how many married couples do you know that you said to yourself at the wedding, wise women, foolish choices? How many of those people are still married? My wife. <laughs> <laughs> There's a person waving to you back there. The, the child waving to you. Um, so I, I would say that that wedding has probably, that marriage probably has a better chance of succeeding than Kate and Petruchio. Um, I don't know. But it's, it's, Art imitating life once again, and I think the important thing is whether you believe Beatrice and Benedict love each other, and they seem to enter into the relationship of uh, being adversaries, then friends, then lovers, and I'd say that's a pretty good formula for a successful successful marriage. I would agree. I'm a total hopeless romantic, which is why I pick these plays all the time that I direct, you know, you know, like 12 Angry Men. Um, 
Um, yeah, romance of that. There's heart. Uh, I like plays with heart, you know, with the, I mean, a lot of things. And I totally believe that Beatrice and Benedict are like, you know, eternal. I do, because I think that's, and you know, that was, that was a big thing for this production for me was like really locating heart really where I could visually and every other way getting at that side of it as much as I could. The Claudio question is an interesting question and it's one that I understand. And I have to keep coming back to the same thing that we talked about in the cast, which is, what would you do? What would you do? What would you do if someone came to you that you've been at war with for two years, trusted with your life to have your back, you came back alive, and whether the problems with Don John or not are, are known amongst all the soldiers, I don't know, but this is a person you're in war with, and he says, your fiance is having an affair. I, I don't know. I mean, I, I uh, that, because that, those are the given circumstances. Right before the wedding. Right before, the, yeah, the night before the wedding. And this is a 5 a.m. wedding in Shakespeare's time. People were married in the morning, by the way. You know? So it is post haste. And the reality is, um, a lot of people would go to a lot of, I mean, you'd have a conversation, you know, for sure, I imagine. And he takes it a step further. You know, if he sees anything tonight, which he sees in the window that happening, and like four hours later, he's supposed to be, you know, so do you spend four hours pacing and then at the wedding go, I can't do this, you know, and destroy her. I told a story last seminar of the, of the New York, it was in the New York Times, um, of a man at his wedding who went through the entire wedding and then asked at the altar, for everyone in the audience to locate the envelope under their chairs and to pull it out. And in it was a picture of his wife sleeping with another man and he walked out of the way. So let me tell you, art imitates life. You know this. I mean, let's be honest. I mean, let's also be reality. I mean, the reality check is this. I don't want to be totally cynical, but I look at that and I go, come on. I totally believe this in human behavior. Totally. We just don't like it because it's ugly inside of a comedy. But you know what? Just turn on CNN, you know? <laughs> I mean, so so for me, I, I find it disturbing. I'm not heartless. I don't like it. But we got to lean into it because that's what happens. And the reality is, is that he acted on information. He finds out the information is false, and he reacts to that, too. He does the thing that he's asked to do in the Zoom, and he's willing to make good in the way he can by marrying his niece, or, yeah, my brother has a daughter, you know? And so I have to believe in that narrative. I just have to, because it, as soon as I try to fix it for you and make you feel better, you know, and say, oh, I, which I tried to do, I tried to have Hero, which you may have seen in the tomb scene, looking down on me. Yeah. That was my gesture to say, does it help if she sees this repentance, yeah. you know, to address that very concern. I also have Margaret throw my lord in there down to Leonardo in the wedding to sort of say, I know the truth, and he shuts her down, and she doesn't have the chance. So those are my two areas out where I could support a more modern notion without bending the play. Can't change the text, you know. Uh, I can't, we can try all we want to have Claudio in tears through all that stuff, but he still says what he says, you know. And by the way, dad doesn't say very nice things either, you know. That's about honor, that's about lineage in Shakespeare time, that's about family name, that's about men and families, you know, dowries, it's just a different worldview. <clears throat> so. so along those lines, I was thinking last night that this play is over 400 years old. And the playwright gives us two very interesting, a lot of interesting things. But he gives us the line that Beatrice says to to Benedict, what when he's saying, what can I do for you? And she says, in all seriousness, kill Claudio. That was a line Shakespeare gave to that character over 400 years ago. What is that saying to an audience where there are women in the audience that don't have a lot of power, were chattel a lot of times, but he says that. Then we get his hero, who he 
gives us a character who is wronged and he puts that in front of a public that has probably been used to hearing uh, women particularly that they are accused of things they didn't do and he puts that on the stage it's absolutely incredible and i really that really struck me in your production david about how uh, your comment is valid we look at it as a 21st century audience at the same time those characters as david said we didn't make up what they said it it's it's extraordinary it to me that he gave us those two people so it softens it a little bit for me and as david said this is reality I mean, how many times have women been accused and continually yeah. are accused of things be it rape or what have you, that they had no part in, but the man gets away scot-free. Shakespeare gives us to gives that to us in this play. It's really extraordinary. One, one other thing I just I would like to add Where are you? Where are you? Out, I love I love the fact and I I assume this is Shakespeare who did it. I can imagine a bunch of guys meeting together in a bar today and one of the friends comes up to Claudio and says, Hey guess what? This is gonna happen tonight. You know, it's the bachelor party the night before or something. And and he says, no way, you know, you've got to come and see what's going to happen tonight. Your wife, your fiance is being unfaithful to you. And he says in front of everybody, this is my point. Once Claudio says in front of everybody, if this is true, yes. I will tomorrow. It's an oath. Yeah. He, yes, that's my point. Had he not said that, we don't know that Claudio would have just disappeared or what. The fact that he did that in front of his friends meant that he had to follow through. And yeah, that I, was amazing. I mean, I hate to say it, but I really do get it, wrong or not, just in terms of the worm that gets in your brain. And I get it when I put it in context that this is a kid that's been at war for two, three years, you know, has been like, you know, putting, exerting revenge, exerting physically, you know, look, coming and looking for context of comfort and finding love to remove what is already probably something unstable about the experience and then walking i mean this this is what we did to our soldiers <laughs> you come home you, you you it's like we want a contact we want a warm and we just we we destroy them and what are you where are you going to push out your energy where are you gonna and i think i shakespeare you nancy said i mean it's it, brave playwriting and extraordinarily potent and pioneering in terms of what a maverick you know he was to put those things on stage and risk frankly a lot by doing it you know so i it's not that i disagree it's not that i don't, uh, like agree with the choices but I, my job is to illuminate human behavior my job is to illuminate both the, the good part and the part that makes us duplicitous and the parts that are uncomfortable you wouldn't like it otherwise if I tamed it somehow or sugarcoated it. We'd be sitting here going, well, I don't get why our body is so nice. <laughs> I mean, it's true. Comment over here. I've always, at least recently, <clears throat> have been feeling that much of yours has been underrated. And I'm less feeling that not only through your production, but I love irony and paradox. And when you have the main plot, which is really a mess halfway through, Claudia and Hero, the ones who unravel it are the most incompetent, <laughs> unintelligible <laughs> folks that he ever invented. I mean, they beat the rude mechanicals. Yeah, I agree. Time. And and yours just really fits the bill. I, I love that irony. That I do these, too. These these high powered people can't figure things out. And these knuckleheads. <laughs> so perfect. I say, you know, it, we've said it a million times in reverse lives. Every time I've done this I'm like, you know, if if Leonardo had just listened the first time that Tom Brady comes up and says, Hey, we've apprehended these two villains, and they you know, I can't, I have no time. That close. But Shakespeare is a genius. I mean, one of the most potent things I, that stuck with me that, that, that I remember learning about in his work when I was a student, student of acting and a student of, of classical theater. I remember a professor pointed out that in Richard II, you know, that there's 
the gardener is trimming the hedges, has one scene, and in it captures the perspective of the realm and the leaders and uses gardening as the sort of uh, metaphor, that these base characters, you know, that he did this over and over and over. Yeah, capture irony, you know? And that's what made him not an elitist, which is so so much irony, because people think, oh, Shakespeare. But when you really know him, what a humanist, you know? What a, and so thank you for, for bringing that point to us, because uh, I agree, I think that those roles can just be stupid, you know? And I think we're treading a nice balance, I hope, at least here, that they have, they occupy a place of humor, you know, but they're just silly enough for us to go, really? You know? And, uh, yeah, so it's a good point. Thanks. And their names, Doc Berry, Oakley. Yeah, yeah, okay. Oh, okay, yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> of course, that was a real device, you know, the watch yeah. in, in the cities. I mean, there was watches, you know, that, that, that these neighborhoods, there was like volunteer fire departments. It's a very similar thing in the Elizabethan world. Okay, you mentioned a few minutes ago uh, when Beatrice asked uh, Benedict to kill uh, Adam. And so I didn't expect that to get a laugh. I didn't, you know, it seemed like a serious matter. Did you, were you expecting to laugh on that? Yeah, I've never seen it or been in a production where it doesn't because it's so, it's so startling so and it's yeah. so, you know, it's nervous laughter because <laughs> we really don't know whether or not he's going to do it. Well, yeah, and also, you know, this is a scene about them. The scene starts, you know, about one thing. It moves very quickly into, you love me. Okay, you know, I, I'm not going to confess that I do. I do, but, you know, I'm not going to, you've caught me in a happy moment. I was about to confess. Do it. I love you with so much of my heart. There's none left to confess. Come, did me do anything for you? Kill your best friend, you know. <laughs> and it's like, you know, that's that she she enters into the scene before Benedict with probably that right there. I could yeah. kill him. I could kill him. Yeah, I could it, kill yeah him. it seems serious to me. So I, I was I was surprised. I hadn't. Oh, it is that. serious. Yeah, not, she's she's not, seen, not. I have not in the production now. Yeah. Okay. Not, not live. I mean, I've seen the movie. Okay. And I, yeah, I, I and, and I haven't asked Kim. Kim's playing it exactly right. She's playing it dead on. Yeah. Like I want him dead. You know. But it's so startling because the scene goes like in in 25 lines, travels the arc of a, a play. Tragedy, I love you. No, I don't love you. I love you. Okay, I love you too. Kill your best friend. I can't. You're going to kill me if you don't, you know? <laughs> and then what's interesting too, not to get too, too deep in terms of feminism or philosophy, but it is there, which I love. That she asks him to kill Claudio, he says he can't. She goes, then she goes on a tirade of how she's, how the world has pinned her into a place of being a woman and can't act, which is the same thing that we know is happening today and drives us crazy. And then, so she, she has to rely on him no matter what. You know, she has to. She doesn't have any other avenue. So it still comes back to the issue, and he finally comes around and says, "All right, I'll do it." And then we sort of love him, I think, for when he comes out and does it, you know. And and I'm I'm in agreement with you. There's always there's, when I and I've seen this play. I love Much Ado About Nothing, um, and I know the lines coming. And it's I'm I'm exactly with you because I understand the sentiment that Beatrice is explaining or, or requesting, um, and I know it's going to get a laugh. And I think it's startling for people that haven't heard it. And it's not meant, I don't believe, in any way to be flippant, but in, it's surprising. And I think some of the laughter comes because audiences know that line is coming. But I, in last night's performance, something happened that I, I had never remembered before, is that that attitude that David just expressed with Beatrice being so frustrated, it mirrors Hero in a way, because Hero also is being accused of something she can't do anything about. Beatrice has the power in a way to say to Benedict, Hero didn't get to say that. And the two of them mirroring, mirroring each other 
the two women. I got it in that production last night. I had never noticed that before. Yeah, I, I really don't. I honestly have to tell you, with, with now I'm old enough to have enough experience behind me, I, I do not think there is a production where you could find your way into that line with the scene behind it being built the way it needs to be built and not go off. Uh, you would have to bend so much stuff in order for it not to, because <laughs> our ears hear it in a modern context. We are modern. You know, we hear it in a, a world of killing all the time and guns and the, you know what I mean? So it's just like, we just, it just lands on us in a way that our, our world would have to change its context in some way for us to not laugh. Do you think the audience 400 years ago laughed on that one? I do. Okay. I do. Yeah. I did too. I just wondered. <laughs> yeah. And, and that and the, uh, Benedict comes back and says, no, you know, I can't do that. And yeah. Actually, that Shakespeare writes the first thing he writes in Benedict's response is the letters H A, not for the wide world. Ah, uh, and I don't think it's. It could have been ah, you know, but I doubt it. People have tried it, but it is the moment of oh, you know, <laughs> it is the moment of yeah. You, I that's, and I think I think. We laugh because we also realize for Benedict there's how preposterously difficult the that decision is going to be. You know, we sort of all, I think, embrace his very quickly how he received it, as a, in addition to how we receive it. You know, because you know his response is going to be, ah, uh, <laughs> you know, I wasn't expecting that, and neither are we. You know. Okay, my goodness. We're there? On that yeah. note. Oh, good. You've been in a, I like to say that in my 13 years of being here, the preview audiences yeah. are so intelligent and so receptive and so willing to give the benefit of the doubt to whether it's.